welcome to the Prairie Conservation Action Plan's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Morose and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan. Every month, PCAP asks someone to present either in the form of an online webinar or an in-person talk in a Saskatchewan community on anything to do with Native Prairie conservation or species at risk. Stay tuned for upcoming Native Prairie Speaker Series webinars. On February 16th, Corey Scobie with the Royal Alberta Museum will be talking about burrowing owls. On February 27th, Ben Sawa with Saskatchewan Ministry of Environment will be talking about the Habisas program. That's the hunting, angling, and biodiversity information of Saskatchewan. More information is available on the PCAP website. Just click the Communications tab. I'd like to take a moment to note that in-kind support for this project has been given by Saskatchewan Ministry of Environment. This project was undertaken with the financial support of the Government of Canada and the Federal Department of Environment and Climate Change Canada. Now, a bit about our presenter. Ryan Fisher completed his undergraduate degree at the University of Regina and his Master's of Science at the University of Saskatchewan and PhD back at the U of R. He then moved to Edmonton to complete a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Alberta and worked with Environment and Climate Change Canada, Canadian Wildlife Service, for two years. Much of his research and past work experience has been focused on understanding issues faced by species at risk in Prairie Canada, including work on Sprague's pivots, growing owls, and frugianous hawks. He is currently the Landscape Conservation Specialist with Saskatchewan Ministry of the Environment. And now I will turn it over to Ryan. All right. Thanks very much, uh, Caitlin, and I hope everyone can can hear me okay. Uh, I'm phoning in from Regina, so it's nice to be able to speak to folks uh, outside of the city here. Um, so what I wanted to do today was um, give you a little bit of an overview about some of the things that we're working on in Saskatchewan Ministry of the Environment, specifically the uh, Habitat and Lands Unit here um, in uh, the Ministry of the Environment. So a couple of the Two things that, that we're working on in the ministry are, are related to habitat or land cover and land use mapping. And the other stream of modeling efforts are dealing with uh, species habitat relationships. And of course, those two things aren't separate. We need really good information on the habitat um, in order to make relatively robust and relatively accurate species ha habitat relationship models. And so one of the first efforts that I wanted to talk about today was a pilot project that uh, Ministry of the Environment initiated a couple years ago, the Prairie Landscape Inventory. And the goal of this project was to evaluate some ways to update Saskatchewan's land cover in the agricultural region. And a really large emphasis for this project was placed on using different methods to be able to distinguish native from tame grasslands. So grasslands that have been broken at some point and replanted with exotic um, grass or forb species. And so this project, like I said, was initiated a couple years ago, actually even before I arrived here at the ministry. And, and it's being led by uh, Ben Sawa, who um, I heard is giving a talk in about a month or so on Habi Sask. Um, so Ben Sawa is the project lead. And there's a couple um, internal ministry folks, Beatrice Prieto, myself, Ed Beveridge, and our uh, supervisor, Yin Ten Huang, who, who got this project going. Um, we do have a or did have a uh, project steering committee composed of uh, individuals from Saskatchewan Research Council, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Parks, Culture and Sport, uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada, Ducks Unlimited, Water Security Agency, uh, the Saskatchewan CDC, and uh, individuals from Sask Polytechnic. Um, and I should also mention that um, a lot of the funding from this project was, was gathered internally, but um, we also, uh, through the lead of Ben Sawa and Beatrice, um, received a lot of funding from the Plains and Prairie Pothole Landscape Conservation cooperative down in the US so it's quite a quite a large uh, team effort and and um, and I'm lucky enough to be able to the one to, to speak about some of our results and so this project came a little bit about uh, came about um, once we started having a look at some of the GIS layers that we currently have in the province um, and 
probably most of you are familiar with sort of three base or base layers that are available in the agricultural region in Saskatchewan. And one is the uh, Southern Digital Land Cover, and that was uh, constructed in the mid-1990s, I believe. Um, another uh, base layer that's out there is uh, a layer from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada that's circa 2000 um, that kind of maps out land cover and land use throughout the agricultural region. Um, in Canada, not just Saskatchewan. Um, and then Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada also has a yearly product um, called the Cropland Inventory, which gives a lot of really, really good information on uh, different cropland types um, and, and uh, land uses and land covers like that. But when we started looking at those base layers, a lot of them are currently relatively out of date. Um, so as I mentioned, that uh, SDLC product is fairly old, and and the Agriculture Canada, we're, we're now dealing with a layer that's about 17 years old. Um, and also, when you look at those three layers, they, they tend to do a relatively poor job at distinguishing um, those native grasslands from tame grasslands. And you might be asking yourself, I'm, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but um, in terms of why is figuring out what is native and what is tame so important, um, obviously you know, both uh, internally to government and externally to NGOs and conservation organizations, um, native grassland is obviously a high priority conservation habitat. Um, as, as all of you know as well, um, the native grasslands tend to be important biodiversity areas. There's um, you know, quite a few bird species that rely on native grasslands, insect species, and, and things like that. Um, and then when we actually start to look at individual species as well, there's, there's some that prefer native grasslands over tame grasslands. So um, a lot of you might be familiar with Sprague's pipit, which tends to be a native grassland specialist. Um, in most areas, the only place that we find, find them are in native grasslands. And so we need that important underlying uh, land cover um, information in order to make relatively robust and, rabbit and accurate species habitat models in the province. So in order to do that, um, this Prairie Landscape Inventory Project was started, like I said, a couple years ago. And we established a um, a uh, small study site in the uh, southwestern part of Saskatchewan. So for those of you are, that are familiar, this, uh, this blue outlined area lies within the Battle Creek uh, PFRA pasture, just um, southeast of, of Consul a little bit. Um, and the study area was about 219 square kilometers. Um, and one important thing to notice is that uh, the study area is just entirely composed of either native or tame grasslands. Uh, there's a little bit of cropland that kind of bumps down into the study area, but the predominant land cover types um, within the boundaries are either native grasslands or tame grasslands. And we obviously had to understand what was out uh, on the landscape. Um, and so we did a bunch of ground truthing last year. Um, and we were also able to um, access some, some ground truth data sets from uh, Jeff Throat from Saskatchewan Research Council, and also from uh, Steve Davis with Environment and Climate Change Canada. Um, and, and all of those data sets put together um, equaled about 147 ground truth points, uh, 82 in native grasslands and about 65 in tame grasslands. Um, our, for our veg plots, we uh, established 10 meter by 10 meter quadrats and recorded the percentage of native grasses and forbs and the percentage of uh, tame grasses and forbs and shrubs and things like that. Now, as I mentioned, um, the big push or objective behind this project was to evaluate some different methods to be able to distinguish these two land cover types. Um, and so we chose these, these three methods. One was a remote sensing method based on uh, the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI. You might hear me refer to that um, as, as the talk goes along. Uh, we also used high-resolution LIDAR. Uh, LIDAR just stands for light detection and ranging. And then we also did a heads-up digitizing um, method as well. And I will, I'll talk about um, each of uh, the three methods in the next uh, few slides here. 
So for the remote sensing method, uh, we actually ended up using 30 meter Landsat images. Um, we tried to go up in, in scale a little bit and looked at some of the, the 250 meter resolution MODIS imagery and, and that seemed to be a little bit too big to really uh, identify some of the field borders and, and things like that. So we stuck with a little bit of a higher resolution product even though um, the proce computer processing time was a little bit more intense, but it seemed to work out pretty well. Um, and like I mentioned, uh, we relied on NDVI and that's just simply a measure of vegetation productivity in the pixel um, that it covers. And to give you a little bit of an idea, healthy green vegetation typically has a higher uh, NDVI and bare ground and more dead vegetation, vegetation that appears brown has a significantly lower NDVI. So that's sort of the scale that we're working on for NDVI. High is really green, um, low is, is less green. And we, we started looking at some uh, research, this research that had uh, come out of um, the, the Suffield, Department of Defense Suffield area um, doing this exact same thing. And they were looking at how um, NDVI changes throughout the growing season to be able to distinguish native and uh, tame grasslands. And so that's, that's sort of the technique that we used. We didn't just look at one scene, but we looked at changes in NDVI um, in the two habitat types across the growing season. Um, so this is a little bit more for some of the GIS and techie people out there. Um, but uh, we downloaded all the um, cloud-free NDVI scenes from 2005. This was the year when we could get almost an entire growing season uh, of cloud-free days. And uh, based on chatting with some of the um, folks from Ag Canada, we knew that there hadn't been any habitat changes in the study area since 2005. So what we were looking at in the imagery reflected what was actually on the ground in 2016, 2017. And we gathered all of the uh, Landsat images in that area that we could between April 1st and August 2nd, August 6th. Sorry. Um, and we had to do a little bit of pre-processing, so we removed uh, some of our ground truth points if they landed in a pixel that did have some clouds. Um, and we also, in our modeling procedure, we included the percentage slope um, in the area because we figured that uh, there wouldn't have been a lot of breaking of native prairie on areas that are relatively steep. So some of the coolies and, and river valley bottoms and things like that. Um, again, a little bit more, uh, some of the statistical details, but um, we split our data set up into 70% um, training. So we used 70% uh, of the data to construct the model, and then we looked at how well that model was able to predict native and tame grasslands in about 30% of uh, the data that we left out. Um, obviously, NDVI, um, NDVI on one day can be correlated um, to NDVI 16 days down the road or a month down the road. Um, and so we just substituted different days in and out of the models to figure out which days or day uh, best provided um, uh, the best distinguishing uh, between native grassland and tame grasslands. Uh, we use logistic regression, but in the end, the, the model with the best overall classification, so when we looked at um, the model at best able to distinguish native and tame. It came out with uh, including NDVI on May 18th, so relatively early in the growing season, and um, NDVI uh, a little bit later in the growing season on, on June 19th, and then that uh, variable that represented slope, so areas that um, had a relatively high slope tended to be uh, native grasslands. And just to give you a little bit of, a, of an idea of what one of these Landsat images looks like, um, so this is NDVI from day 170. It's kind of that um, June June 19th period. Um, these light areas have high NDVI, and the more gray areas there and down in here are areas with uh, low NDVI. And so we could see quite clearly when we looked at the Landsat images, um, these outlines of tame fields with the ground truthing we knew that these light areas were definitely tame grasslands. And so it actually showed up pretty well on the, uh, on the Landsat images when we started kind of breaking down the days um, throughout the growing season and looking at which ones best sort of highlighted that um, uh, difference between the two land cover types. 
Um, I'll talk a little bit about right at the end about the classification success of each one of these, but um, I wanted to kind of go through and give you an overview of each one first. Uh, the next method that we used was the uh, LIDAR method. And for those of you that don't know, LIDAR, um, in the simplest sense, you fly a plane over an area and it shoots down laser beams. And depending on how long it takes that laser beam to hit the ground and bounce back up to the plane, it gives you an idea of the height of vegetation in an area, as well as changes in elevation of the bare ground underneath. So. In this little picture in the upper right-hand corner, we, will, we would get an image from LIDAR that gives us the bare ground, and then another image that gives us an indication of the height of anything above uh, the bare ground. So we get two products from that. And we were using a really high, high-resolution um, LIDAR. So uh, each of our pixels was about 2.5 centimeters. So um, that's, that's uh, about as high-resolution as any product that I've ever worked with. Um, and when we first started the project, uh, we thought that we could use the height of vegetation to compare the two different uh, habitat types. Um, likelihood that the tame grasslands would be taller than the native, but when we really started digging down into the, the information that was produced, um, we, we couldn't use that. But we discovered something else when we were looking at the uh, digital terrain model, so that model looking at changes in elevation of the bare ground. And we started uh, being able to see tractor furrows, which was, which was really, really interesting. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like on the next slide. So, so here's um, a small part of our study area. And on the left, you see the tame grassland. And you can see easily the, the furrows that were created when that field was likely broken. Um, and you do have to remember as well that down in this area, these fields were broken you know, um, quite a few years ago. And, and we're still able to see those tractor furrows uh, from the imagery. Whereas when you cross the field boundary right here, you get into the side of native grassland and there's none of those linear furrow lines. You kind of get the, you know, the variation in terrain, some little hummocks and probably a little area where there's a, a small, used to be a, a small creek or water running through. Um, and what's also interesting is that when we were ground truthing is that you can actually detect uh, these furrow lines when you're on the ground standing in a field. Um, so it was really quite uh, interesting when we started looking at the imagery that we were able to see that. Um, and to give you a little bit of an idea of scale, this is a two-track trail running through the, the image here. So this is about the width of uh, one tire track and one tire track here, and that's the vegetated area in the middle. So, so quite a cool um, product that, that we were able to, uh, to work with and, and get some information from. Now, that was great. Um, we could see it with our, our naked eye when, when people were looking at the image, but we had to find some way to translate that um, so that a computer could, could quantify the presence of those furrow lines. And I'm not going to spend too much time here, but um, we used the Hillshade Hill product um, for for all of the analyses um, dealing with the bare earth, we didn't didn't uh, look at any of the vegetation height information, um, and then we had to do some processing in ArcGIS to isolate those furrow lines and then uh, uh, group fields together based on uh, the presence of those furrow lines. and And this is what some of that. Um, the next slide will show some of what that image analysis produced. So this was after all of the ArcGIS processing. And these dark areas are areas where furrow lines are present. And these lighter areas here are areas um, with none of the furrow lines. And so you can see there's some um, fields that are really dark. And we think that those are maybe more recent um, fields that have been broken. And then some really light areas um, where we think maybe more historical tame grasslands. But it really did bring the, the contrast up once we did some of that in, uh, image analyses between the two uh, land cover types. So this was just all done in ArcGIS on a sort of pixel by pixel basis. And then we uh, brought it into another program called eCognition. And it's just an object-based classification piece of software. And it basically tries to group pixels together based on similar characteristics. And then you can assign a land cover type to it. So we threw that last image in and said, uh, these are tame grasslands. These are native. Uh, divvy up the, uh, the raster or the image into different polygons, and then we'll come out with our final uh, land cover 
uh, classification. Um, and just to give you, you know, other folks on this call might be interested in some of the other um, uh, useful uses of, uh, of LIDAR. Um, so we were, because it was such high resolution, um, we were actually able to observe uh, these red dots here are fence posts that you can see from the imagery. So, you know, we're, we're not dealing with huge objects that we can pick out with this really, really high resolution um, LIDAR images. The, the red just indicates that it's taller relative to the green, which is um, shorter. Um, a couple other things. Um, we, we knew that we had some uh, nesting ferruginous hawks in, in that Battle Creek PFRA pasture, and when we overlaid the ferruginous hawk nesting points, we could easily uh, pick out the trees or small shrubs that uh, they were nesting in, uh, represented in red here. This green is uh, likely a dugout or a small uh, wetland. Um, and we can also identify some human structures. So this is a corral um, in that Battle Creek pasture, and you can see the fence lines running um, away from it. So, so there definitely are some other um, uses of this LIDAR project um, that would be really neat to, to um, try to apply in, in different areas of the prairies. And lastly, so the last method uh, that we used was a, a heads-up digitizing method, and this simply involved um, using the fly sask imagery that we had um, and some of the rangeland eco-classifications, and we uh, contracted out um, this particular part of the project to Jeff Thorpe at Saskatchewan Research Council, and poor Jeff had to sit in front of his computer and look at the imagery and then chase uh, trace polygon outlines of the different habitat types within the study area. And what we were really interested in for this heads-up digitizing, so Ben and Beatrice had had quite the extensive conversations with folks in Alberta with the grassland vegetation inventory. And so we wanted to look at whether or not um, it was possible to uh, have a comparable product in Saskatchewan. And, the, and we tried to follow the methods of the Alberta GVI as, as much as possible. Um, when, if uh, some of you who are familiar with the G, GVI, you'll, you'll recognize that there are a lot of attributes associated with each polygon. And as you add attributes, that obviously takes time during the digitizing process. And, and we knew we probably wouldn't have um, either the time or the funds to um, include as many attributes as the Alberta GVI did. So we scaled it down a little bit. And, and um, our main uh, product that we wanted to produce included um, a cover type associated with each polygon, an ecosite, uh, some site-related modifiers, for example, um, was there sagebrush um, in a native grassland cover type. Uh, the fly sask um, is available 3D and does give some information on uh, height of, of things on the landscape. And so we could look at um, how tall uh, shrubs and how much cover there were of shrubs uh, within each polygon. We could also look at tree cover and height, um, bare soil, and water. So, so what we did was, was uh, basically make a scaled down version of, of Alberta GVI. And this was the type of product that, that came out. This is a smaller part of our study area. But you can see it does give a little bit more information other than just is it native or is it tame. Um, so the native grasslands are yellow. Tame grasslands are orange. Uh, we get some information on herbaceous wetland vegetation, um, water bodies in the area. There was a little bit of cropland, like I said, that snuck down into the study area. And we get some information on uh, some rural residential areas as well. So this is a homestead or something like that. Um, so as you can see, a little bit more information than, than the other uh, methods uh, gave us. So to give you a little, bit of, uh, a little bit of an idea of some of the results that we came up with, just in terms of the mapping, and, and hopefully these next three slides sort of give you an idea of, of uh, what the products look like compared to each other. Um, this was the remote sensing or using NDVI, and shown on this map are just the project boundaries, and then our ground truth points. Um, the black triangles are native, the blue triangles are tame, and then uh, what the classification was using whatever method. So um, the remote sensing actually did a pretty good job. Um, we pick out the relatively large tame grasslands in orange in the different areas. Um, 
there was a little bit of uh, speckling, uh, is, is what I like to call it. We get some small pixels that are almost entirely surrounded by native grassland that are being classified as tame. And so we're, we're trying to look at ways of, of cleaning that up a little bit um, as we go forward. The LIDAR was, was also interesting as well. Um, exact same uh, legend on the top right-hand corner. So it picked up um, those tame grasslands very, very well. Uh, we did run into a few issues where it was picking up um, and classifying some of the little coolies or, or fingers coming off a relatively large um, um, river here and classifying it as tame. And, and we're also working on, on cleaning that up a little bit. But as you can see, it, it picked up um, a lot more tame grasslands compared to the remote sensing um, and even some of these smaller ones that, that were appearing um, that had the tractor furrows. And then the heads-up heads digitizing, um, we didn't quite get the entire study area uh, digitized, but um, for the most part, again, we had really good uh, ability to distinguish the two habitat types in addition to uh, some of the other information that the heads-up digitizing produces, like cropland and, and wetlands. So now you're probably all wondering about classification success on our um, uh, ground truthing data. And the remote sensing, like I said, performed really, really well. So uh, we cor correctly predicted about 88% of the native grasslands and about 87% of the tame grasslands um, using that NDVI or remote sensing method. Uh, the LIDAR also performed really well at identifying tame grasslands, and where it failed a little bit was identifying plots that we had determined to be dominated by native grasslands. And in that case, what we think is happening, so we could still see the tractor furrows there, so the fields had been broken at some time. Um, but when we were doing the ground truthing, uh, it seemed like a lot of native species had started to reestablish in those areas. And so it's, it's interesting. It, it looks like some of these fields um, that had been broken are starting to revert back to a more dominant uh, native grass species um, composition, native grasses and, and mosses and lichens and things like that. Um, heads up digitizing also performed really well, about 82% uh, correct native and 91% correct tame. And then we overlaid the current, um, one of the current best layers that we have for land cover mapping in Prairie Canada, and that's the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada circa 2000 layer. And it's really good at identifying native grasslands. and that's essentially because it classifies everything as native grassland, at least in this area. So a lot of the, the fields that we had uh, ground truth as tame um, were classified at least by this area in the grassland slash native grassland category. So you can, you can see here um, we're, we're getting significantly better classification success than, than the layer that's currently being used. Um, which, you know, depending on what you're, you're using the layers for, for example, if you're um, looking at species habitat modeling, uh, you know, for, for example, the species that you're working on, they might not really distinguish between the two grassland types, and then you're, you're pretty good to go with this one. But if you're working on a species like Sprague's Pipit um, or some other native grassland specialist, uh, being able to distinguish those two habitat types is really important. And at least down in this area, um, this particular layer uh, wasn't quite up to snuff compared to what we were looking at. Um, then, as I mentioned, we also wanted to look at the cost or the time that it took um, to uh, do each of these different projects. So the NDVI method, uh, the Landsat imagery is free. Um, it's all freely downloadable from, from NASA websites. Um, it took about one to two weeks to do a lot of the mosaicing and looking at um, you know, cleaning up the data, looking at whether or not there was cloud-free information or pixels with cloud. So it took a little bit of time on the back end once we had downloaded the information. But once we kind of had everything linked to our points um, and had the imagery cleaned up, um, it didn't really take long to do the uh, the, the pixel-based modeling, only about a week or so. And, and we think moving forward, we kind of have the, the um, general framework worked out. And so, so that'll likely drop a little bit. Uh, in terms of the LIDAR, it, it cost about $50,000 to do both the flights and uh, the company that we had to do the flights did all of the data processing. Um, as you can imagine, even in this relatively small study area when you're dealing with um, 
2.5 centimeter pixel resolution. These are huge rasters and huge amounts of data. So it takes a really long time to not only acquire the data, but also to process it. And that was all done by an external company that we had contracted. So there was about three days of flight time and about four to five weeks of uh, data processing time. But once we had it and once we had the, that imagery figured out and what to do with it, um, it's, it's real, it really doesn't take very long to, to do the processing which we were quite surprised at um, since it is uh, such large um, uh, GIS information. The heads up digitizing, um, the imagery acqu acquisition is free. Like I said, it's through FlySask. Um, so there was obviously upfront costs um, quite, a, quite a bit earlier than this project, but at least for our project, um, the imagery was free. Um, there's uh, really no kind of collecting or managing uh, data per se, but uh, the digitizing aspect um, within that small study area, that area that I showed you, took about um, 28 to 60 man hours to, to complete um, the digitizing within that study area. And the only reason for the range is we tried two different um, attribute types, one which was quite scaled down and then one um, attribute that uh, assigning attributes to polygons that had a little bit more information. So it obviously took um, the digitizer a little bit longer to get that extra information into the polygons. And of course, all three of these methods uh, require about one to two weeks of field work for ground truthing. Obviously, it depends on um, access and, and how big the study area is. But to summarize, um, all of the, the methods that we used um, significantly increased our ability to distinguish the native and tame grasslands compared to at least that one currently available uh, GIS layer. We're looking at how the Ag Canada cropland inventory um, compares as well right at the moment. Um, and as far as we know, uh, no one has used um, the techniques that we use to classify LIDAR imagery. So it was kind of a, a, an interesting new project, a new way to look at using uh, LIDAR imagery to classify land cover. So in terms of next steps, what are we planning? Um, well, we, we did this in a relatively small area, and that was just so we could compare those three methods. And it seemed like the remote sensing or NDVI method kind of stood above the rest. So we're looking at trying that out in a couple other study areas across um, southern Saskatchewan. And, and uh, because, you know, that relationship with green up and, and vegetation productivity likely changes throughout the province. And so we might have to uh, look at doing some new models um, you know, sort of in an east-west and, and north-south gradient across the province. So we're, we're looking at doing some ground truthing uh, this summer. And, and like I said, all the imagery is free. So that's sort of the basic or only expense with this project. Um, as I mentioned, LIDAR is relatively expensive for the amount of area that we could cover. Um, we used relatively high resolution. And there, there might be an opportunity to get some lower resolution uh, LIDAR information and do the same thing, but uh, we don't have access to any of that right now. So LIDAR doesn't really seem to be feasible uh, province-wide. And um, although we had really good success with the heads-up digitizing, it's as, as uh, folks in this room likely know, and um, it's very time consuming consuming and, and very expensive. And we had the, the great uh, luck to have Jeff Thorpe doing the um, digitizing. And so that's probably one of the most experienced digitizers that you can get to do this. And so um, it's, it's likely very difficult to uh, get a lot of people working on this project that would be able to make that distinction as good as Jeff did. So that kind of uh, wraps up the first part of my talk. And, and what I wanted to do next was talk about some of the species habitat modeling initiatives that, that we're looking at in the ministry. And that's over on this side here, looking at species habitat relationships. And I just wanted to give a little bit of background um, to let folks know where a lot of the data comes from in order to do this modeling. Um, so the majority of species location data in the province um, that, that we have access to provincially is stored um, in the Saskatchewan Conservation Data Center. And for those of you that use uh, HabiSask or some of the online web mapping, um, you're quite familiar with a map like this where um, some of these circles uh, and, and these polygons represent areas where um, uh, high priority or species at risk have been observed throughout the province. So, um, so we have access to a lot of that information that's, that's stored internally. 
Um, so what type of information is stored um, by the CDC? So there's a bunch of different ones, but just to highlight a couple, um, we store a lot of internal uh, results of internal government surveys. Um, so, so biodiversity surveys that we do as part of Fish, Wildlife, and Lands that's stored in the Saskatchewan CDC. And then uh, what's what's really uh, what we're really interested in and, and really happy about lately is that um, all of the information that, uh, for example, consultants uh, may um, gather when they're out doing an environmental assessment or academic researchers who are out in the field, um, a lot of uh, if if you've signed up for a research permit in Saskatchewan, part of the conditions is that you submit your species location data to us, and so we're really excited to be getting a lot more information now um, through the the species detection load forms on biodiversity in Saskatchewan. Um, a couple other data sets that we're using um, we're we're looking at using other citizen science. Um, based data. Um, so things like eBird uh, and the breeding bird survey, um, things like Frog Watch and the Christmas bird count. Um, there's also a couple websites that have tried to gather as much biodiversity information in the world as possible and, and this Global Biodiversity Information Facility is one of them. Um, you can go on there and freely download any species location data that they have access to. Um, another program that we're we're looking at we haven't quite used yet, but is the uh, the iNaturalist program as well. And so, um, you know, we're we're including um, extra information beyond what's stored in the, the Saskatchewan uh, CDC. Um, and we're also hoping to get a lot of new information in addition to the, the information coming in from the species detection load forms, but we're hoping to get a lot of information from Bird Studies Canada, Saskatchewan Breeding Bird Atlas, which we're really excited about. Um, we'll hopefully get some really good information on uh, geographic distribution and habitat associations from this program. And then there's some other programs like the uh, Canada 150 BioBlitz that the Royal Saskatchewan Museum is working on. So that's definitely not all of the data sets that uh, we have access to, but that gives you a little bit of an idea of what type of information is, is going into this, uh, this modeling. And there's obviously a little bit of a, a gradient in terms of how much data there is out there um, and where it is in the province. And, and this is not dealing with data quality, this is simply data quantity, um, how much information there is out there. And, and, and of course information on plants, and especially rare plants, tends to be pretty sparse in the province. Um, insects are kind of down at that, that um, sparse uh, sparse side of things. Um, mammals and amphibians are kind of in the middle um, and then birds tend to be the, the most widespread um, and uh, large data sets that we have access to. Um, you know, usually uh, with the Saskatchewan CDC data in addition to all those citizen science, we, we actually do, whoops, uh, we actually do get pretty good coverage of birds and, and that's not to say that in, in general um, all mammals are right smack dab in the middle. There's definitely mammals that um, have received more attention either because they're species at risk or other high priority species where the, the data quantity and geographic coverage is, is really good. But in general that's sort of the, the trend that we see when we, when we start going through a lot of the data that's available. In terms of species priorities for this modeling, uh, we're really looking at at-risk species, so either ones that have um, been listed as federally at risk. Um, and then we also look at the uh, provincial conservation rankings that uh, Saskatchewan CDC produces. Um, we obviously have to have species where there's enough data available to actually do the modeling. Um, you know, it's really tough to, to come up with a species habitat model when there's only five observations throughout the province. And uh, and I'll touch on this a little bit later, but we're we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. So so we're not looking at modeling species habitat relationships, for example, where uh, critical habitat has been identified throughout the province. Um, sage grouse is a good example of this one. Where we're not going to go back and and redo. Um, the sage grouse critical habitat. Um, and then we're, we're also trying to make contact with various researchers um, and other organizations throughout the province that are uh, doing similar similar things. Um, we, we don't have the time um, to do all of the species and so we're re really looking at forming some collaborations with uh, under other individuals that are doing similar things in the province. 
So when, as I mentioned before, um, those of you that are familiar with Habisask and, and the online, weapon, um, online mapping platforms, this is the type of information that you might see when you call up one particular species, a bunch of points on a map. And unfortunately, where the issue arises is in an area like this. So the question then becomes, is the species not there because we've never done a survey in that area and been able to detect it? Or is it simply that this is low quality habitat? And, and that's the knowledge gap that we're really trying to fill in with the species habitat modeling. So we're trying to go from a map like this that's all kind of disjunct and just point based to something more like this that gives us an idea of where the probability of presence or, or high habitat suitability is for different species in the province. And so when we would look at that same area, it's likely that there's a mix of unsuitable habitat in that spot and a little bit of uh, highly suitable habitat. So likely we just haven't gone in and surveyed for that species. So that kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of where we're thinking and where we're going with this uh, species habitat modeling in the province. So some of the goals, as I mentioned, I've, I've covered quite a few of the, the goals of this particular project, but we're hoping to fill in some knowledge gaps. Um, for example, Kasiwak and Sarah providing information or, of where species are in the province. Uh, we also want to provide a lot of this information to our stakeholders. Um, and uh, obviously, from an industrial planning perspective, knowing where things are, are likely to be on the landscape is extremely important. Um, our own internal purpose, purposes for identifying and prioritizing areas for management and, and what type of management can all be informed by, by this type of modeling. Um, obviously, identifying important areas for biodiversity, once we start uh, stacking these, these maps on top of each other of where different species are in the province. Um, and another aspect that we're looking at for, for species that are slightly more data deficient, um, we're using some of these models to prioritize areas where we can get out on the ground and actually look at whether or not um, our models are, are uh, predicting where a species is likely to be. Um, to give you a little bit, again, this is more for the techie nerds in the in the audience, but to give you a little bit of information on the nuts and bolts, um, a lot of the data that we have in the province is presence only, so we know where a species was, but we don't necessarily know where a survey has been and they simply didn't detect the species. Um, so we're, we're kind of limited to looking at this presence only information. Um, for those of you familiar with the data load forms, you might notice that we've recently asked for all of the survey information and so with that information we're really trying to jump from this presence only data to knowing where surveys have been done and where species have been observed to get at a much more robust um, modeling kind of framework using presence absence data but right now we're, we're limited to presence only and we're using Maxent um, to do a lot of the modeling using uh, land cover layers climate and soil uh, layers to help uh, predict species distribution or probability of occurrence throughout the province um, and we're uh, we're obviously validating these models to figure out whether or not they're they're predicting or they're looking okay, um, and that's either using uh, data that we've kind of held out from the modeling procedure where there's enough of it, and and or like I said, um, developing some new surveys to to see how well our models are doing at predicting where species are throughout the province. Uh, we obviously do a lot of quality control um, before data is included in any of the modeling. So CDC does all their own quality control of the data. Um, we look for outliers. So for example, if there's a Sprague's pipit detected in the boreal shield, we'll, we'll take that out. Um, a lot of the observations have high location uncertainty. So uh, we get information in that says there's uh, a burrowing owl that's likely um, within five kilometers of this point. And so we, we really can't use information with that much uncertainty. Um, and uh, for the citizen science information like eBird and, and that type of thing, we're, we're really looking um, only at data that's been reviewed um, on their side of things. So to give you a little bit of an idea, I've kind of showed this output, but um, we're, we're doing all of the output and all of the analyses at um, one kilometer by one kilometer pixel. So this entire image is, is composed of thousands of one kilometer by one kilometer squares, and it'll give us an idea of um, 
where a species is likely to be in red and where it's not likely to be in green. Uh, we also do get a little bit of information on how uncertain this model is. So um, in this area, for example, we're fairly certain that the species is there. But over here, um, even though it's coming up as a high probability of occurrence, um, we're a little bit uh, more unsure about that classification. So we're getting uh, two outputs from, from these type of models. And like I said, we're, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're not doing, um, we're, we're trying to collaborate with as many individuals as possible. So just to give you a little bit of an idea, um, as I mentioned, we're, we're going through kind of a lot of the priority species, but uh, we're working with some folks from University of Regina and uh, the Royal Saskatchewan Museum. Uh, graduate student Leanne Heisler is working on uh, predictive occurrence maps for small mammals. Um, we've uh, gathered some information from Andrew Jake, Jakes, who used to be at the University of Calgary on pronghorn connectivity modeling. Um, we have all of the information on uh, the crit critical habitat models that have been produced by Environment and Climate Change Canada. Uh, no, a lot of folks aren't too interested in stuff that's going on above the tree line, but um, we, we have managed to get a bunch of information from the Boreal Avian Modeling Project, which um, produced density maps of about 70 plus um, species in the boreal forest. And, and we're going to be working with um, Steve Van Wilgenberg from Environment and Climate Change Canada to uh, refine some of these models based on his field work. And like I mentioned, we're, we're actively looking for folks who are interested in this type of thing um, and or who may have uh, completed some of these modeling efforts uh, already in the province. And you might be asking yourself, where is this information going to be available? Well, um, the data from both projects, for example, the LIDAR information um, and, and the species habitat models will be available um, eventually on Habisask. We're, we're just working out some, some kinks and some issues on how to try to present the information. Um, and a little bit of a, a shout out to Ben Sawa, as uh, Caitlin mentioned, he's going to be uh, giving a talk in about a month here, February 27th, on, on uh, the capabilities of Habisask, and that'll give you a little bit of an idea of how uh, the information that we're producing is going to be um, uh, dispersed to both the public and uh, all of our stakeholders in the province. And so it looks like with that, I've used up about 50 minutes <laughs> of the seminar. So um, Caitlin, I'd be more than happy to uh, answer any questions that, uh, that people might have. My uh, contact information is here. Um, I'm based out of the Regina office. Um, so if any folks are around and want to chat more about this, I'd be, be more than happy to uh, discuss some of these different projects. And my email is here as well. And I think uh, Caitlin's going to send that out. Um, in the future as well. So uh, with that, uh, thanks very much, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, I'll just change it back to Caitlin here. Great. Thank you very much, Ryan. That was a really interesting presentation. Um, for anyone in the audience, um, if they would like to ask a question, you can just type it in, um, and Ryan will be able to answer it. And if there aren't any questions, then maybe what I'll do is just take a second to show the PCAP website where you can get information um, in, about future presentations. So it's pcap-sk.org. And if you click on the Communications tab and then Native Prairie Speaker Series, this is where we have our most up-to-date um, information about upcoming presentations. So the next one is February 16th about Burrowing Owls by Corey Scobie. And like Ryan said, the February 27th one is about uh, the Habitat program. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to type it in. If anyone um, you know has missed today's presentation, this presentation will be uploaded to the PCAP YouTube channel. And that's PCAP dash, or sorry, youtube.com slash user slash PCAP and you can view it at your own convenience. Um, we'll also post the link on our Facebook as well, so you're welcome to go to the PCAT Facebook page for updates. Oh, and there is a question here. Um, what are the next study sites for the NDVI method? 
Sure. Um, so we're actually in the process of, of trying to figure that out right now. Um, we're, we're looking at trying to acquire some data um, where ground truthing has already been done and then fill in some of the holes where we can do our own uh, ground truthing this coming summer. And so those areas are, are a little bit up for grabs at the moment. Um, and, and that's another thing that I did want to put forward. If anyone does have um, ground truth information on native versus tame land cover in the province, I'd, I'd definitely be interested in chatting with you and um, to help us kind of streamline where we're going to be this summer. We're, um, we're also hoping a little bit to uh, work with um, Barry Robinson from Environment and Climate Change Canada, um, and he's going to uh, try setting up some study plots in Alberta so we can try this technique out there as well. Okay, and the next question, uh, Ryan, were you able to include years since plowed as a covariate when classifying or misclassifying native slash tame using LIDAR or NDVI? Yeah, that's a really good question. So we didn't have information on uh, the age of the fields, unfortunately. Um, so so we we couldn't do that. Um, we we had chatted a little bit with the um, agri agriculture and uh, agriculture and agri-food Canada folks that are familiar with that area, and and um, and yeah, the the fields in that area are pretty old, but but we didn't have information on um, years uh, years since plow, unfortunately. Okay. Um, and can you distinguish between whether you were identifying historic land use, cultivated or uncultivated, versus current land cover, um, native dominant, tame dominant, recognizing that some never cultivated areas may be invaded by crested wheatgrass and that some long ago cultivated areas may have native species reestablishing? Yeah, exactly. So, um, so that was a, a little bit of the um, the nice thing about the um, the remote sensing method is that it was able to pick up uh, some of those invaded areas. Um, so areas that had absolutely no no tractor furrow lines when we looked at the the lidar, but um, the remote sensing method was picking up uh, invasion. Um, so that was that's kind of a nice thing about the um, the NDVI method. It is it is able to pick up some of those pockets as long as they're about 30 meters big, <laughs> which is kind of the, the pixel size. We, we were able to, to pick up some of that um, invasion in the, uh, in the study area. Okay. okay. And there was actually a couple questions about that, so um, that's really good to know. Um, there's a question here. Does grazing intensity of timing affect the classification? Yeah, we we think it does for sure, um, and and um, these fields were were grazed, especially when we were out doing the um, the ground truthing. Uh, we we didn't have any kind of long term information about grazing as well, and and that's why we're we're interested in trying uh, this out in some other study areas to see whether um, those relationships are, are pretty stable with um, NDVI at different times of year, and and trying to um, to tease that out a little bit from from some different study areas. Okay, um, the next question um, with the change in PFRA status. How will this affect the percent of land that can be maintained as native? Um, I'm not quite sure I understand the question, but um, this is this is more of a identification type um, type project. So so we're not uh, we're not, for example, identifying native in different land tenure types. This is simply trying to identify what. Uh, what's on the ground and, and what's not, but um, you know, as you can see in this particular area, we were a little bit surprised based on what uh, information there is out there um, suggesting that this is mostly uh, native grasslands. When it appears like there's a, at least a, quite a bit of tame in that particular area, and and this area was mostly crested wheat and some Russian wild rye and things like that. So, yeah, it was kind of a, a little bit eye-opening when a when we were down ground truthing and, and B when we were doing some of the analyses. Okay, um, the next question, will the biodiversity model results be available to the ranchers who manage the rangeland in the province? And if so, will there be a cost to acquire it? Yeah, no, so our, our hope is that this information will will end up on that HabiSask platform um, and will be available uh, to the general public at, at no cost. We're, as I said, we're just trying to figure out um, 
the, the best ways to, to present this information on HabiSAST, um, and also some different ways um, that, uh, that people will have access to it. So, so there definitely won't be a cost, um, and it'll eventually make its way to HabiSask. We're, we're just trying to iron out some details about that. Okay. Oh, that's great. Good to know. Um, Colin Murray from CDC Manitoba, um, will you try to classify ground truth grassland or tame in more than um, either slash or? You alluded to areas that were somewhat tame or native, which may cloud the model. Yeah, so so that's a, that's a little bit of an issue um, with with this particular study area is that it just had the two habitat types, so we didn't have to worry about um, classifying cropland and, and things like that. And and again, that's why we want to get into um, some different areas and and some some different, um, for lack of a w better word, landscape contexts to uh, to see how well this um, this modeling um, procedure performs in other areas. Okay, and the next question again from Colin, um, yep. have you checked out Sentinel-2 imagery providing 10 meter resolution? Yeah, yeah, so um, we, that kind of, um, we were just made aware of that sort of at the, the tail end of this project, and so yeah, that's, um, that's definitely going to be another option uh, that we can look at. We, we found that the, um, as I mentioned, we looked at the 250 and it was a little bit too big, and the 30 meter Landsat um, is kind of a good mix of accuracy and um, relatively not computer intensive time, um, but but definitely yeah we we want to take a look at that 10 meter Sentinel product and and see what um, what that looks like as well. Okay, um, and another question: uh, Would areas with high litter cover, which isn't green, cause misclassifications using the NDVI based model? Yeah, I'm not in, entirely sure about high litter cover, but um, but yeah, definitely areas with yeah high liver uh, li litter <laughs> litter, um, and also a lot of, uh, for example, standing dead vegetation would um, would uh, reduce that NDVI number, and so that may result in in some uh, some mis misclassifications either. We're 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 delving into a little bit more um, with our ground truth thing because we recorded information like. Um, uh, the presence of moss, lichen, and, and different types of um, forbs and grasses to kind of um, uh, go into it a little bit more in depth um, to see if we can pull out, uh, you know, um, for example, is um, sh do we need to adjust our definition? We just use greater than 50% native cover is, is native grassland, but is there some relationship with NDVI between what percentage is native and what percentage is tame? Okay, um, and then there's a comment from um, Dan Johnson with yep. University of Lethbridge um, that um, he said um, insects were mentioned as low information. If you want, he has expertise and some data for the most common group of herbivorous rangeland insects, which is also a major food supply for wildlife, um, like grasshoppers and their relatives. And in fact, you could arrange to visit a number of sites or so and detail the community, which is typically 20 to 60 species in this group. And that is often tied to particular vegetation and community. That would be, yeah, that would be absolutely great. Um, I kind of know Dan through some burrowing owl stuff in the past. And so, yeah, I, I definitely love to love to chat with you, Dan, and, and, and look at, um, you know, whether there might be some opportunity to, uh, to do some, uh, some insect modeling in the province. I know that um, Corey uh, Sheffield over at the, the Royal Saskatchewan Museum is also interested in some of that uh, as well. So definitely uh, would love to have a chat with you about uh, that in the future. Okay, and um, you have your um, your email on the slide there. So if he didn't grab it, I have his. Uh, he left in the message here too, so I can pass it on to you as well. Um, are any other questions before we finish the webinar? Oh, it looks like one more just came in here. Okay. Um, will you be investigating combinations of multiple methods or imagery types to increase accuracy, or just proceeding with a single data source? Yeah, we're we are um, right now just proceeding with the single data source, um, mostly because the we wouldn't have access to the lidar anywhere else in the province, um, and so unfortunately that's that's not an option to kind of um, 
pool information uh, to, to increase increase the uh, the classification accuracy. So we we don't have um, information from the other three methods in other areas in the province, unfortunately. Okay. I should um, actually I shouldn't say that. Sorry. We we did do some of the heads up digitizing in. Uh, three or four other study areas in the province, and so so we might try to do some uh, some ground truthing in those areas as well, and, and compare the those two methods at least the NDVI and the heads up digitizing in a couple other areas. Okay. Um, well, the last comment here um, says, "Great job, Brian. Thanks." So I guess um, maybe we should leave it at that. So thank you very, very much, Ryan. This was a really interesting presentation. Um, and we'll have it uploaded to YouTube in the next couple of days. And you can check the PCAP Facebook page for um, for updates about this presentation and for future Need to Pray speaker series. So thank you very much, everyone, for attending this event. And um, I hope everyone has a great day.